Hi, and welcome back to Broadsheet Melbourne Around Town. I'm Broadsheet's Editorial Director, Katja Buckbill, and the host of this guide to Melbourne. If this is your first time here, don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you never miss a video. If you are of a certain age in Australia, seeing Pia Miranda's face instantly transports you to your youth. She is stamped in our collective memories, either because, like me, you watched her breakout performance in the 2000 film Looking for Ella Brandy when you yourself were in school and it felt like you were watching a part of yourself on screen, or because the film is one of the enduring expressions of what it was like to be a young person growing up in Australia in the 1990s. Pia Miranda's Josephine Alibrandi is an iconic character in Australian cinema, but her acting career didn't finish with that portrayal. There have been many more films and TV series since then, including a triumphant season on Survivor, which we are going to talk about today, and this year she's releasing her first book. She'll be talking about the memoir, Finding My Bella Vita, at the Wheeler Centre's Spring Fling in October, and she joins us today. Welcome, Pia. Thank you for having me. I like that you said first book. Made me excited. <laughs> just, the, just the beginning. <laughs> so your book takes us from a small volcanic island not far from Sicily, where your paternal grandparents were from, and then we head all over the world. There's casting couches in Los Angeles. There's close encounters with Harvey Weinstein in Rome. There are Fijian beaches and survivor tribal councils. But as you write in the first pages of the memoir, for many, I'm forever a teenage girl captured in celluloid as Josie. And I think that's true for many of us. I'm sure I, I'm, I'm going to say millions of Australians. <laughs> and I know the book is still one of the most stolen books from libraries around the country. Yeah. But the image of you as Josie and the scenes in that are crystal clear. I can recall watching it as if I was, it was yesterday. Does that feel the same for you? Is, is that period a blur or was it actually really easy to recall moments from that to, to write in the memoir? I think it's been easy to recall because it was such a big part of my life and um, it hasn't left my life, you know, because every time I walk around, there's always someone who stops me and says, you know, you're Josie or people just love Alabrandi so much. Mm. And so it was easy. And I think because I'm still in contact with Melina and Kick, I, you know, we just relive that time so much. So yeah, it's not it's not hard. It's almost burnt into my brain. So writing parts about the lead up to the audition, you know, where you discuss walking down Ackland Street in Melbourne and bumping into Kick who's yeah. stressing out at a cafe <laughs> and about this part he wants to get and yeah. mentions they're looking for an Italian, they can't find one. I mean, you take us through, obviously as, a, as an Ala Brandy fan, yeah. reading that part of the memoir was amazing, going back into that time and kind of being transported back to what it was like in 1990s Australia, or actually it would have been late 1990s when you were auditioning. Yeah. The process of that, you talk about basically going into a room with a hundred others and basically it gets cut, cut, cut until you're in the final two. Was that how it worked in those days? Was that how you were auditioning for, say, Neighbours? No, that was really unusual. I think because, you know, Josie was an Italian girl and there weren't that many young Italian actresses that were working at the time. And I think it was just because they were doing a really wide search. They weren't necessarily looking for someone who had an agent or who had been working for a long time. And so that's really common when they're looking for new faces, but that's really the only time I've ever done it as yeah. far as acting goes. It felt <laughs> like, yeah, just, I could see in that scene, you standing there with 99 other people. I didn't who know looked, that was going to be the case. Like yeah. I flew myself to Sydney and then I told Kika, I said, I'm going to Sydney to audition. And I thought maybe I was doing like a regular audition. There might be, usually you turn up to a place and there's like nine or 10 of you in a room. And then, you know, one by one you go in. I did not realize that there were going to be hundreds of Italian girls trying to get this part. So I was definitely deflated when I walked in. I was like, oh God, why did I waste my money flying to Sydney? I could chat about looking for Brandy <laughs> for the next hour or two. I'm sure listeners will feel the same and that's why they can read the memoir. But that was 25 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and the memoir goes into time before that, yeah. time after that. Uh, it gives us some real insight into your personality <laughs> and your inner thoughts. And I think for a lot of people, including me, it was surprising. A, there was a lot of similarities with Josie in some ways, but also to know that someone who, I guess you never really know what's going on in some someone's mm. head when you yeah. see them on screen. Let's. I want to go back to the beginning. You describe basically how you arrived in this world. 
You flew out of your mother <laughs> with only about 20 minutes warning, so she was lucky to make it into the foyer of Cabrini Hospital in Malvern. I still like to arrive early. Lateness stresses me out. You arrived early I today. I did come early today, yes. Is that, you know, I think you, you talk a lot in this book about your anxieties and all the things that were going on in your head. Did these things become crystal clear as you were writing or you've been pretty well aware of them for a long time? I think I've been well aware of them, but it was nice to be forgiving of them. Like rather than thinking that it was a problem that needed to be fixed, which is how I looked at those, you know, insecurities or anxieties for a long time, I realized they made me who I am. Mm. And so it was nice to look back on, I was saying the other day, you know, when you write about yourself as a young person, it's almost like a mother to a child. So you can look back at this young person and I could see it from the outside and I was so forgiving of all of the things that were going on in her or my brain. And it was really nice, you know, it was really nice. I think the anxieties and also forgiveness is another part of the memoir. Yeah. One of the things you write early on is these days I tell my acting students to look in the mirror and determine what they most dislike about themselves or the thing that they think is their biggest flaw because that is the thing that is actually going to book them their first job and that is the thing that makes them special. So I'm sure things have changed over time, but back then when it was Ala Brandy or some of your early acting work, what was the flaw or insecurity that you saw in the mirror that you then think actually helped you get the roles? Just to say, backtrack and then I'll go forward. To, to, I'd say things have changed over time, sure, in the sense that there's more visibility of people who are different, but it's still a very aesthetically obsessed industry. Mm. And if we look at our movie stars or our TV stars, most of them are really beautiful. And so for a young actor starting out, and they're usually beautiful in a similar kind of way, yeah. if you look at all of our exports, they're not that dissimilar in appearance. No. And so, you know, a lot of young actors want to come and they want to act because they, they are passionate about telling stories. And then they start in the industry and then all of a sudden they feel less than because they don't look like a model. And so for me, when I was young, there were most of my you know, acting friends were blonde and gorgeous and, and, you know, really fit the mold of a beautiful ingenue. Ingenue was a very big thing when I started. Mm. People were really obsessed with beautiful doe-eyed ingenues. It was constantly mentioned in interviews and I just did not feel like I fit that <laughs> role. Like I was a quirky, you know, little Italian girl. And so I think, but that's what got me my big job is the fact that I did not fit the mold, that mm. I am a quirky Italian girl with a bit of spunk and I, you know, I don't look like a model. And um, I think that I will, you know, I always say that to people. If I didn't, if I wasn't, wasn't a little left of centre, I wouldn't mm. have got the role of Josie. And the role of Josie wouldn't have been as important because if Josie did look like a supermodel, it wouldn't have meant a lot to so many young girls. Yeah. And I think that's why we all looked at it and it actually felt like us. Once you go through the Alibrandi period, you're, you're off overseas and you're looking and meeting with some pretty incredible directors, Wes Craven, Anthony Minghella, you mentioned. Uh, by that stage, because of Alibrandi, had that anxiety or fear dissipated a little bit? You know, had you, had you already come to terms with, actually, it's my difference that makes me what I am? Or sitting in a casting room with that level of director you go back into oh god and I know you had some experiences where yeah. you were basically told you need to look different yeah it's a good question because I don't know the answer I think I probably fluctuated between the two um I really wanted to work a lot in comedy and I think comedy is definitely somewhere where someone who doesn't fit the mold can really find a great you know a place for themselves mm. But I think I fluctuated between the two. You know, I, I got a lot of great roles as the sidekick, which is actually always, <laughs> the you know, usually the more enjoyable role. Yeah. But, you know, when I did go to LA, I 100% felt less than. I felt like I didn't fit in. I was constantly, you know, my appearance was constantly commented on. Um, and, and not just me. I mean, I have so many friends that we just laugh and talk about the stories and the things that were said to us. So yeah, as, as much as I didn't want to fall into that trap, it's hard when the messages are always, you know, negative. Yeah. Now, one of my favourite sections of this mm. memoir is the survivor section. Yay. <laughs> I think whether you've watched one season or 20, just getting the behind the scenes gems that you provide about what it was like to first arrive and the room you're kept in and, you know, the little dip pool with all, all the flies and then actually starting. It was so intriguing. I felt like I was there. I, I wanted to read a little section of one that kind of made me laugh. You're talking about what it was like when you finally got to sleep um, 
you're, mm-hmm. you're talking about finally working out how to sleep um, and just the way things changed over time. So on the flip side, when it wasn't raining and the moon was full, huge crabs would crawl on us while we slept, which sounds terrifying, but crabs meant food. In the early days, we would scream in horror, but soon enough we were hardened and would pick them up by the pincers and throw them in the pot for breakfast. Sorry, crabs. Another one that I absolutely (laughs) loved was, learn how to tweeze facial hair with seashells. was originally for my own moustache, but in the end I had quite the beauty salon going on out there. When you you went back and you you had quite an intense experience, not Mm -hmm. only, and sorry, spoiler for people, Pia wins the season of Survivor she's on. You've gone through that period, then you went through what you describe in the book as a pretty horrific post period with, and I, again, not just not just for you, but anyone who appears on a reality TV mm-hmm. series is often victimised by anonymous trolls who think it's fair to kind of attack you mm-hmm. left, right and centre. In terms of writing the memoir, it must have been cathartic in some ways and you, or, or was it kind of going back into a bit of a traumatic period it was complicated because it actually, that was, it took me a long time to write that second chapter about the aftermath because I really wanted to make sure that I was writing about my authentic experience and not still in a space where I was trying to make people like me. Mm. So I was like, I can't go into this and write about it going, these are the reasons I did this and like me because of this. I just had to talk about the experience and how it felt because I still Years later, I feel really good about it. But at the time, for maybe one or two years, I was really quite traumatized by it. And I think probably angered by it because I think there was a lot of gender bias in the reaction. Mm. And that really peeved me. And so, yeah, it it was hard to go back and write it because I didn't want to be like, I'm going to change the world. I just wanted to write about how it felt. And I think reaching out to Richard... Hatch. This is a great, this is a great little story. Again, Richard Hatch, who, uh, again, if you're not a Survivor super fan, he's, he's the man. He's, he's the, the, man. the man who kind of started yeah. the, it the helped. alliance strategy yep. thinking. Yeah, It helped me uh, it shape that chapter. So it wasn't just about me. It was about what do people experience when they go and play a strategic game and how are the different reactions from people? Because also Survivor is 50 days. That's not. And I, as you say, it's longer in Australia mm-hmm, than it is overseas, mm-hmm. correct? That's a long, yeah, longer period. Yeah, I mean, uh, American Survivor used to be 36, I think. Yeah. Now it's 28 or something. It's 50 days is a long time. And the person they return back to your families, I think families are the unsung heroes of Survivor mm. because our families deliver us to this game and who they return back is not the same person. Yeah, you discuss that in the book about the fact that people don't return back and kind of put on the weight they lost and move on in a month or two. Mm-mm. This can take years. And for some you describe, it never really goes away. And you yeah. also talk about the fact that it was the best experience of your life, but in some ways it stays with you. And you have this anecdote where you talk about being back at a table in a, you know, you're about to go and film a series and you're looking at all these cookies and you're thinking, uh, can I, can I eat them? Like how many of them yeah. can I eat? And, and again, it sounds like for some people who were part of that series, it's affected them negatively in some ways for many, yeah. many years afterwards. Yeah. I think, you know, it's a very different experience as well to be a winner because there is a little bit of winner's guilt that happens mm. because you are on this journey with a bunch of other people and some of those people walk away with nothing and they've been through just as much pain as you. Mm. But then at the same token, you know, winning it also means that years later I can see it as this beautiful, amazing experience. Yeah. Um, but even for me, you know, for years, I mean, we would all get together and still talk strategy. I should have done this. I should have done that. And Janine would always go to me, stop saying shoulda, you won. Like if you'd done that, maybe you wouldn't have won, but it's just, it really messes with your brain, but you know, I still love it. Yeah. And Janine, um, is, was one of Miranda's kind of closest allies and, and has become a lifelong friend yeah. in the aftermath as well. What I wanted to finish on was a little anecdote from when you were younger Mm -hmm. that I think sums up a few of the themes in the book. And it takes us back into your Italian family. So that was your father's side. Your Mm -hmm. mother's, your mother's side wasn't Italian. And I loved it because I'm a, I'm Jewish and I see the same crazy aunt style, um, exhibitions Mm -hmm. I have in my family, Uh, but everyone has their, their kind of characterful family members. It doesn't, whether you are, you know, part of a different ethnic group or not, but also there's, 
there's stuff about food in there. So I, I just wanted to read this out and, and to, to end. So you talk about your, <laughs> you're in this scene and you say, when the Zias or aunts got together, they enjoyed holding a bowl of water and oil above my head while they hummed and cried in an effort to remove my curses, which they described as exceptionally strong as I apparently had a natural tendency to attract them. Funnily enough, there is a brief shot in the kitchen, no acting required, in looking for Alibrandi where Josie's nonna does the same thing. I didn't mind all of this palaver too much because I really hated being cursed and I was always given food as a reward when the curses were gone. I'll do anything for a free snack. I just love that part and don't <laughs> really true. have any questions apart from the fact that for me, if you're thinking about buying this memoir, that, that to me ties it all in, this <laughs> incredible uh, family you had and the curses, which you describe as being, you know, it's, that's a funny anecdote. But they weren't eventually things that you were able, that washed off your, off your back. No. Yeah, I think so. I think my sister really enjoyed reading that stuff because for us it was quite cathartic to laugh about the fact that we do have a little bit of, I think I say somewhere in the book, we were always a bit sort of paranoid about our spiritual cleanliness, you know, like this desire to be perfect because to please the Madonna, to please God, all of that stuff, it's hard to get rid of that. And so um, it, for us and for her reading it as well, she really enjoyed it because I think it puts it into perspective. And you, you, you do talk about how you, when you went into some auditions, that's when you're like, I'm praying to God. Like oh, that's yeah. when, when that, that came back. But I also love the free snack thing. I'll also do anything for a free Same. snack. It's one of the reasons I'm in this job. Yep. I'd love to know, you do talk about the fact that chicken chips have always been there for you. Yes. But are there any snacks from your childhood or from those years spent with, with that side of the family that are still your most cherished and that you go to in times of need or that you share with your children. I'm really interested to hear that because a lot of the book is about food. Yeah. Um, I think my Nan's lemon slice is probably, I still make it and it's just one of my favorite things. And if I make it for myself or for my cousins or for my sister, everyone kind of melts a bit. Everyone's like, Nana's lemon slice. Everyone has and, that's your, and that's your mother's mother. Yes. That's yes. my mum's mum. Yeah. So it's just a way to make everyone happy in my family. Um, same with my Nana's gingerbread is the same thing if I make that. But as far as like a fast snack, you know, I love actually just the um, a, a, a teddy bear biscuit with butter in the middle. Two teddy bear biscuits, but teddy bear biscuit sandwich. I have not. Dip it in a cup of tea. I think that might be your invention. <laughs> I feel like that's a Pam Miranda yeah. invention. I always have that all the time. So, you know, the teddy bear biscuits, get butter, put it in, make a little sandwich, have a cup of tea and dip your teddy bear biscuit. I feel like that's the best of both worlds is mm -hmm. the the teddy bear, but you're thinking, how can I make this a sandwich? Yeah, Which and is salty butter. A very Italian, yeah. <laughs> Italian approach. The Wheeler Centre Spring Fling runs from October 2 to 14. There are 24 events to go to featuring 60 thinkers, writers, musicians and performers, including Pia Miranda. Go to thewheelercentre.com for more information, but also I urge you Pia's memoir, Finding My Bella Vita, is out now and it's going to make you laugh and cry and you are going to whip through it. I, I can't believe how fast I read it. It's oh, very entertaining. Nice to hear. Thank you, Pia, for joining us. Thank you for having me. That's all we've got time for today. As always, you can stay up to date at any time on broadsheet.com.au or on Instagram at broadsheet underscore mel. See you again next week.